All right, here we go. Overdrive, off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker up on TSN 2 all afternoon. Brian Hayes, Gord Miller, a beautiful Monday here in Toronto. I feel like I just showed up to a wedding in a T-shirt. Listen. You got the blazer on, the shirt, like you're all done up, and I showed up in a golf shirt. This is a very serious program. I get that. And you have to dress to impress. But the last time I was here on Thursday, you you were wearing an untucked golf shirt (laughs) that may or may not have had food stains on it. So I just... You never know what you're going to get. You you, You really never know what you're going to get. The reason... I I, I do throw people off every once in a while when I'm wearing the suit in here. Like, I'm pretty committed to the July and August golf shirt look. I think it's a very well-received look. Sure. July and August. I think everyone accepts it. And generally speaking, I would be wearing a golf shirt very similar to the one you're wearing right now. So I do notice yours always have a TSN emblem, which would suggest to me you haven't paid for a shirt you've worn on this show ever, but that's fine. That's neither here nor there. Um, I didn't happen to pay for this suit, so I guess I'm being somewhat hypocritical right now. But every once in a while, I come in, and I get the call to do a Sports Center hit. Okay. And if I'm doing a Sports Center hit, today I was with my guy Glenn, I got to throw a suit on. Got to have the tie on, too. I do get rid of the tie for 4 o'clock. I could have a tie on right now. Then that, I would that really would, be that would really be showing me up. Really be showing you up. That's okay. But um, yeah, this one's going to be a good one too because I was doing a Sports Center hit on the Boston Bruins. It was going on with the Bruins and one of my oldest friends, my good buddy Dylan Stewart, one of the biggest Bruins fans ever, inherited that sadly from his dad Derek, one of the great guys ever as well. He was a big Bruins fan. I remember when I was a kid growing up, it was always Bruins, Bruins, Bruins. Yeah. You know my dad. You know our history. This Dylan grew up in Toronto. Like, right. But his dad was a big Bobby Orr fan, and then naturally that just became a thing. He's always like, you got to talk Bruins. Got to talk Bruins. I'm like, I'll talk Bruins when there's a reason to talk Bruins. No, we got a reason. Now we got a reason. David Krejci has retired. So no Patrice Bergeron, no David Krejci, both retired. Taylor Hall gone. Tyler Bertuzzi gone. Mm-hmm. Like it's Dimitri Orlov gone. Dimitri Orlov gone. It's gonna be a massive step back. It was going to be anyway. Yeah. I mean, it was going they had 135 points last year. Absurd. Florida made the playoffs, and Boston had more than 40 points on them. So even if all of those players returned, they were gonna take a big step back in terms of points accumulation. But I think they've really lost, a, obviously, a big part of their identity, but also what they got on the cheap for yeah, so long. Yeah. Bergeron and Krejci gave them a discount basically their whole careers. And when you think of the great duels up, of the, up the middle of the ice in modern history, you, you think Gretzky and Messier, you think Sackick and Forsberg, you think Sid and Gino, now you think McDavid uh, Eisen, Eisen and Drysaddle, Eisenman and Fedorov. I guess there was a time probably Francis and Lemieux were both yeah. playing up the middle of the ice in the early 90s. Bergeron and Krejci are not at that level, but they're a step below and they're the poster boys of the step below. All they did was win. That's well, all they did was win. And I can tell you that in 2010, when the uh, Flyers came back from 3 nothing down to win that series against Boston, I was doing the series. Krejci broke his wrist in game four. Mike Richards hit him at center ice. Clean hit, but mm-hmm. broke his wrist. Krejci out, devastated the Bruins. The next year, he's so underrated, David Krejci. He led them in goal scoring in the playoffs when they won the Cup in 2011. Right. Like he was a, you know. He had a point of game that year. Yeah, it was, it was always, you know, and I get it. It was Bergeron, mm-hmm. Chara, you know, Tim Thomas. Lucci, and Marchand. All of that. But, yeah. but the fact is that David Krejci very quietly, and you know, it's funny you talk about that one and one A sort of thing with the centers because it it only works if one guy's willing to be one A, mm-hmm. right? Like Messier had to be willing to take a backseat to Gretzky. Fedorov had to be comfortable, and and Fedorov was comfortable not being the front man. Look at Malkin; he spent his right. whole career doing right. it. Right. So, so it's got to work because it doesn't work if the one guy's bitter that I'm not in the power play. If I was somewhere else, I'd be making more money. That's right. Right. Like I'd be. No, you, you're right. You've, you've got to accept your role that you're a great player, but there's a guy in front of you that's a little, that's even greater, and that's going to get even more of the accolades. Well, and Dreis- that's exactly what's happened. Leon Dreisaitl. With yeah, the it's the same players. thing. Like, I, I am fascinated by their future. They are clearly best friends. Yeah. They 
lived together, I believe, in the summer. I think they go back and forth between Toronto and Muskoka. They were just at the tennis. Yeah. They've been down at the Dome. They're spotted. They were at Boots and Hearts over the weekend. They're spotted everywhere together. Um, they're constantly together, McDavid and Drysaddle. But what is going to happen in the future when both of them probably feel they've been shortchanged based on price? But Drysaddle certainly has. Like, as much as McDavid is probably worth more than $12.5 million per the best deal in the ho- in the hockey world for years now, based on relative value and relative production, is dry settle at eight point five. It is. It's it, crazy how good of a contract that was. And your boy Peter Shirelli happened to give it to it, him, it, it, it who got, got it, laughed out of town, got criticized heavily for it. And why? Sorry, why is Peter Shirelli? My- <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just I, just, uh, I decided I to associate Peter that. Shirelli? I mean, I like Peter, but I don't uh, know. I just figured but, why not. But it works when you. Peter win. was in the GM in thirteen yeah. down in Boston, so we don't need to talk about that. When you win, right? We, yes. It, that one one a thing works when you win, because I think in a lot of cases, I I, I know this. You know, I, I saw Messier with Gretzky, and, and you know, and he would see the crowds around Gretzky every morning skate, every night. He'd be like. Knock yourself out. He was okay with that. He, and he, yourself, was the, he was the local guy, which is was, amazing. St. Albert guy, yeah. Exactly. Like, but, he's from the Edmonton area. But it, it works when you win. But when you don't win, you wonder if at some point you start to say, I want to go and try on my own. Yeah, and it's amazing how you need, in order, like, it's kind of the chicken or the egg, where you need them to commit to it in order to win. Right. So, it really is which one actually comes first, because... I will give credit to the Bruins, and I think in large part it was driven home by Bergeron, by Krejci, and I think at a time by Chara. This everything stays quiet, everyone goes about their business, and everyone remains a Bruin. And we're they've not, been doing that for 15 years. We don't treat people like rookies. We don't haze rookies. We exactly. Don't, we don't ostracize rookies. We expect big things out of them. Yeah, but you're welcome. You're in the group right away. Yes. By the way, you mentioned your buddy's a big Bruins fan. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of a fan base. You know, not the Leafs, but in Toronto, who's got a more a team that's got a more loyal fan base in Toronto? Now, Montreal, maybe. Yeah, I would say the Habs would be number one. But Boston is like like so. My buddy Bill O'Reilly, his brother Terry, played for the Bruins. Mm-hmm. Like Bill, Bill to this day, like he came to the World Junior with me one year. Met some of the guys from the Flyers. He still hates the Flyers. Right. Like, that's true fandom. He, he was a sixty-year-old man. Yeah, and he hates the other team. Hating on the Flyers, like it, it's. But don't you think that the Bruins do good have good question? A- yeah, it's a good question. I I I think pers- like personally it would be the Habs number one. Now that's anecdotally, but I'd be willing to put a lot of money on that. Yeah, I think you're but because so many people from Montreal live here. Exactly, and also what I just told the story of the the kid whose dad was a fan. There's a lot of that in the Greater Toronto area as well. Who for whatever reason they grew up. Southern Ontario is a little bit different. Like, but Detroit doesn't have that. It, no, exactly. I actually know a family. I've always been told, like, my, one of my dad's best friends. He grew up with like multiple brothers. They grew up in London. One of them became a Detroit fan. One of them became a Leafs fan. The other became a Habs fan because they felt like they didn't have a connection one way or the other. Okay. And I don't know why that was the case, but I guess it just always has been the case, and they've always stayed kind of pot committed. I would say it would go. Mu- Anecdotally, I would say Montreal one. I probably would go Boston too. Don't you think? Like when I when I do games, you would think it would be a Canadian city that well, would be two. But or would it? You know, but it's not Ottawa. But is it's it, not. Is it or? Is it is it the mystique of or? It's is probably it, it probably because it's an original six team. Yeah, and original a lot of it team. is inherited. But Gordy Howe played in Detroit. I mean, right? You know, like I mean, Detroit. And Detroit's won the cup. You know, four times in the last twenty five years. Yeah, I think probably for younger generations, it probably comes down to players like a lot of the players that are driving that. So in other words, I would suggest Pittsburgh is very popular with probably people in their twenties now. Yeah. Because when Sid showed up, it became Sid's my favorite player. So now I'm a Penguins fan. Probably the same thing with McDavid. The Oilers are probably pretty well represented here in large part because of what they did in the eighties. Like if you wanted to jump on a bandwagon, that'd be a pretty good one. And then in recent history, obviously if you want to be attach yourself to a player, Probably could do a lot worse than Connor McDavid. But think about it: the Bruins have won the Stanley Cup once in the last fifty years. Mm-hmm. Now they've been to the Cup final in ninety and in thirteen. Yeah, yeah. So eighty-eight, ninety. They were there in eighty-eight too. Uh, okay. But I mean, and the Rangers the same thing. I mean, the Rangers are the most underachieving original six franchise. I don't know anybody that's a Ranger fan. Right. Nobody. So there's an original six team. <laughs> Comes to Toronto a lot, right? But I mean, they've won the cup once in the last 
80 years. Yeah. Yeah, because it was 54, wasn't it, in 94? 1940. Since 1940, they've won the Stanley Cup once. Yeah, why don't they get goofed on more? (laughs) (laughs) Why is it just a Toronto thing? Like, well, because they have 94. No, yeah, I guess they're still, so. They're still dining out on Yeah, them. and they did go to a cup final in 13, I think yeah, it was. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the Rangers, there's a lot of ineptitude there. Chicago, prior to the Taves, Kane, Quinville era, they had nothing. They hadn't won since 61. Nothing. Um, Detroit's and you're right. Were, but, but, the, like, the, Detroit, obviously, but is but a the Boston great reason really history. Even Montreal's 30 years now. Yeah. Like, that's that's a long time. I know Montreal, they have the right to puff their chest out. 24 is 24. They're the last Canadian team. But they went to, but they went to the final a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was a COVID. It doesn't count. What? It, what? It, it does not. Can I, call, I don't, can I don't I call the Lightning and get the rings back then? Should I take their name off? I guess the from their perspective, it counts. I, what I'm saying is I it, it wasn't a journey that I think a lot of Montreal fans would put up against, you know, anything else. Let's say a conference final. Like, didn't they go to a conference final in the PK yeah. era? Yeah. Like the so, the PK. So, I'll bet you that was a more revered run than that question COVID for you. run. Question for you: The Leafs go to the Cup final. It's a parade down young. Okay. <laughs> no, so I'm kidding. That, so I, here's counts. the truth. Here's the truth. It's easy to say it now retrospectively. I think everyone in in sports back in 2020 during the bubbles were thinking. I don't know if I want to waste, quote unquote, the the cup run or the championship run in these type of environment, in this type of environment, because you didn't get to go. Like I, I mean that I'm not I'm not goofing on Montreal. They they did it, and I'm sure sitting at home it was amazing to watch, and especially considering there was nothing else going on in the world, it really truly was a distraction. So, but if you're in Montreal, like the whole build up towards a cup run is either going to the Bell Center. Or meeting up with friends, being downtown, going to your buddies, and ha- and that was not available to you. So the, the funniest thing about that bubble was you talk about the Rangers. So I was in that bubble at the Royal York. Okay, so there's there were ten teams staying at the Royal York, and the rest were at the X Hotel. Right. So it took a couple of days to kind of get adjusted to what it was going to be like, and you know, to figure everything out, where to go, where your testing was, and everything else. And the Rangers got swept by Carolina. In the remember the best of five, yes. So so we were just figuring out like what to do, and the Rangers were leaving. <laughs> they were done like four days in. Isn't that wild? Like, how quickly it happened? Like we were. So we I was there for another like four weeks. Yeah. Like I barely remembered the Rangers being there. Like it, it was the strangest. Like they, they were literally. We were figuring out where the breakfast room was, and they were packed up leaving. Well, in the jockeying of of games, like games were starting. I want to say at eleven a.m. Yeah, maybe noon, well, one o'clock, the, the, but it uh, was the, the the quintuple overtime game. I I called that, that game. really. I that Columbus, was uh, Columbus, Tampa, Tampa versus who? Columbus. Columbus. I did that game, and uh, it's Braden Point, right? Yeah, and it bumped. The Bruins were playing next, and it was like tennis. You know, like you're like you're. Yeah, you had to sit around and wait, and and finally they said you're not playing tonight. Yeah, forget it. Get out of here. Yeah, so you're not. Now, I, I, they had the luxury of an unlimited schedule, effectively. They weren't sharing the building. They're, right. And the TV networks were dying for anything at that point. They're like, go yeah. ahead, great. We'll push it to tomorrow. We'll happily do that. Everyone's sitting at home. They're going to watch anyway. Um, but, yeah, the Leafs were in and out quick, too. Like, the Leafs, they played five games. They had that great comeback in game four yeah. against Columbus, and then they were awful well, they, in game five. Well, they had the game three. They 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 blew blew the lead in game three, right? Yes, I believe they had a like a three two lead yeah. late or something, and then they did the reverse even more so. Though they were down three nothing or something with three minutes to go against yeah, Columbus. It, yeah, it was a strange, but and then they're gone. They were basically in the bubble for like two weeks. And see you later. Thanks for coming out. I, aren't we glad we're done with bubble? I, 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 yes. I, having been in three of them. Yeah. See, I never bu- I never did were, like uh, a true bubble. It was hard to it was hard to explain to people that it was difficult to be at the Royal York Hotel mm-hmm. for. But we had Nick Felino on a few weeks ago, and Nick was on Columbus, so he was in the yeah. he was in the Royal York, and he said it was terrible because you knew that there were teams at X Hotel, and like X is like so modern. They, they had the pool, had the pool, <laughs> and the Royal York. He's like, it's it's there's nothing going on in here. You could and think- he said they li- basically they they were I don't know if they lied, but they were not telling the whole truth in terms of what was actually going to be available to them. Yeah. Like the NHL had promised all these different activities and all these different meals. Like we got in there, there was nothing. You could take the bus over to uh, you could take the bus over to uh, BMO Field, and they had uh, an hotel. That was at X Hotel, or at, even at uh, Royal, Royal, Royal York. York. We could get on yeah. a bus and go over to to um, 
to BMO Field and do stuff there. And then they had like a patio set up there mm -hmm. in the south end. And you could go to X Hotel or the pool if you wanted to. See, there you go. But right. you still had to, you, get, you had to leave your own spot. Yeah. There isn't a, a pool at the Royal York? Indoor. So eh, that's not we, the uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say now, I, I guess I'll tell the story now, but uh, so the teams had their own food. Like the, each team had their own floor mm -hmm. and a meal room. And they had, they had it catered. We didn't. So I, like the second day, I called Soto Soto. And I was like, because the, 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 the restaurant of the Royal York, Rain, R-E-I-G-N, mm -hmm. never changed their prices. So like a steak was like $85. Really? Well, I was with NBC. I'm like, per diem. They were, they were busting my per diem. I'm not doing that. Put that on NBC. So I, I ordered, and, and Lou Lavarello came down and saw it. we can do that? I'm like, yeah. We ordered Soto Soto every night. Yeah. Like we had that's Soto, Lou's we, spot. We had Soto Soto. I, I think I put on like. No, that's not exactly cheap. It's not like Soto Soto's eight bucks. I wasn't paying for it. Oh, okay. There you go. So if you sneak into I, Lou's. I, I go the there Lou you go. I See, got, Lou will take care of you. I got the Lou train. With yeah. the, the so coach. forget Peter Shirelli. He's out. Lou Lamorello's your boy. That's your guy. <laughs> yeah, that's what you, you should have told me that story five minutes ago. Yeah, Lou loves Soto Soto. Loves it. I do too. Yeah, as you should. It's a great spot. Um, all right, so the Jays are off tonight. They dropped two of three over the weekend. John Gibbons was in town. Gibby was out there for the ceremony on Saturday. It was a great ceremony. Yeah, really. So what you what you should expect yeah. if a team is going to invest that kind of money, that kind of time, and flying people up and bringing people in, and you're going to build it up, and it's a legend of your team, which Jose Bautista is. I thought the buildup was great. The presentation was great. I thought he handled it well. You kind of want to see emotion out of him, and that's what you got. Yeah. Right, and that's I thought it was I thought it was really well done, and then, you know, it was too bad they couldn't get a win on Saturday. But so, do the Jays retire numbers? They retired. They've retired two numbers. Right now, since then, they have rescinded the retirement yeah, of one of Alomar, and that would be Roberto Alomar. But they retired Halliday's thirty-two. Right. Um, so, but so there is technically another level of excellence. I don't think they give out the numbers like. I don't see some of the numbers in circulation. Like, are, are players wearing these numbers? Like well, um, like, Hicks is wearing 12, right? Like, that, which I find strange. Like, yes, Alomar, whatever happened with Alomar happened with Alomar. And the Jays, I don't believe, have ever really publicly announced, like, why they concluded something had to happen. But we're well aware of the allegations and what happened with Alomar. Right. Um, but it's one thing to, to take it, you know, off the wall, so to speak. It's another thing to put it into circulation. Like like 11? Like, does George Bell's number get given out? It's been used. Yeah. Like, you, they're available. These numbers are available. Um, now, Bautista, you know, you could make a strong argument that 19 is probably worthy of, of you know, being well, even if you don't retired. Retire, but if you don't retire it, maybe you just you're, you, you give it out sparingly. Yeah. One of the things that drove Dave Keon nuts was that the Leafs kept giving number 14 to, like, marginal players. Well, my Matt Stajan, my guy. Mon Montreal went out of its way to give 29 to anyone who would take it. Like, after after Dryden left, yeah, they gave 29 to anyone. Really? Gaston, out of spite? Gaston, Gingras, Ward. Yeah. Donald Dufresne, I think, Ward. Like, it was... Yeah. Well, no, listen, the number, like, the Jays' it's numbers... It's retired now. But... Yeah, as it should be, I would suggest. But um, no, to answer your question, like they're they're in use. They're in if if it's not retired, it's being used. But it, it was so. a, it was a good ceremony, and, and you know it's funny when you think about you know the Jays winning yesterday, because it looked grim on Saturday night, right? They, they well, they had that game, and Hicks, who they acquired, came in and couldn't get an out, and yeah, yes. so, so so they lose, you know, two the first two against first the Cubs. Series. Now Seattle's coming; they'd won eleven in a row, but yep. Seattle loses back to back. That's right. Now Seattle's got a. A pretty cupcake schedule coming. They do. I think based on opponents' um, win percentage, I think it's the third or fourth easiest schedule. Down the stretch? Down the stretch. I just think the next 10 days or so. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking the rest of the way. Seattle sets up pretty well. And the Jays have Phillies for two, Cincinnati. Yes. And Baltimore, right? Yeah, they, they got – and then once you turn the page, like we talked about last week, you're talking, you know, it's AL East, a lot of AL East competition. But – um you know, the Jays are still in a playoff spot. They're still, it's, they're one and a half games up on Seattle or a few games up on the Red Sox. It hasn't been great. It's been frustrating. Yesterday, the bats came alive, which was almost amazing to see. Really, the catalyst of that was Varsho early. Yeah. He hit that three-run home run. That changed the whole game, and all of a sudden, they took off. It just feels like, like him and Springer, the last, say, two weeks, 
there's been flashes of it, right? There's been, I mean, Springer got hot in the road trip for a while. Our show did a little bit. Then they cool off again. Like it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency to it. There doesn't seem to be a lot of sort of week in, week out. Well, specifically with the bats, it hasn't been the case. I mean, the arms have been fine. The rotation, the, the you know, defensively, they've been okay. There's been fundamental issues that have popped up, which is something that Schneider's been ranting about really since he got the job just over a year ago, was that they were going to be a professional ball team that's always on their toes and always ready to, to you know, have more than just a passing grade when it comes to fundamentals, and that has not been consistent throughout the year. As, as opposed to all those but, other major league teams that don't care about fundamentals? Well, <laughs> listen, the devil are in, is in the details, though, a lot of times. It's not that you don't care, but you can tell a sloppy yeah. baseball team is very noticeable. Like, you can see it, and... Well, I mean, in the moment, it's one thing where you you may not think much of it, but it it adds up over the course of a season. All the little things, running out singles, yeah. you know, t- turning double plays that should be turned, making throwing catches, the, hitting the, the cutoff right man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like covering your man, doing whatever you're supposed to do. You like you saw Oakland over the weekend that play at first base. Yeah, like that. That's the Oakland A's in a nutshell. So like we, quits on a play, doesn't get there. The Mets had a similar situation oh, to that over the weekend. So th- it's funny the. Uh, so when you do baseball, uh, the cameraman that works on the first base side, so so sort of the concourse level first base side, he's he's important to you because he he goes to the base that the runner's going to and where the throw's going. But he has to really know baseball. And for a long time, was a guy named Mark Johns who was fantastic at it. Like Mark studied baseball, studied the teams coming in. He would invariably go to the right base, and George Bell would throw to the wrong one. <laughs> Mark's shot would be of a guy standing there with his arms like <laughs> right. This is where it's supposed to go. Yeah. So Mark was right, but he, was he had baseball IQ. Yeah, but you're saying George didn't well, necessarily. Well, at the plate he did. Yeah, well, exactly. I guess that's all that's really needed. But uh, yeah, we'll see. The Jays again off today. They need it. They've been uh, that was 17? 17 games in 17 days. That's a lot of club. That's, that's a lot, man. Clubhouse. And they've had injury issues. Like Bichette's obviously been out and. Um, but, the Romano's been out. Romano's, Kiermaier's been but it out. It looks like Romano's close. Looks like Bichette is close. Yeah, I think Romano likely will be activated tomorrow. That's what I've been reading. That's what I've been hearing. Hopefully, he returns tomorrow. I don't think. I'm not sure Bichette returns tomorrow, but it wouldn't shock me. Maybe by the When's weekend. When's Manoa back? He's down Triple A now. Yeah, that's like they've got some off days coming up. I think they're going to skate through those with a five man rotation. And and the question becomes, do they bring him back up before September when the roster expands anyway? Like the, the kind of easier cop out is wait till September. I think it's the smart play, personally. Like you sent him down because you struggle. You, you sent him down because you've seen issues with what he is delivering you. Do not continue to yo yo this guy back and forth. Send him down, say, we'll bring you up in September. But if he comes up in September, I'm not sure what he's really going to supply the team. Like I thought Ryu looked pretty good yesterday. Yeah, it looked great. Didn't yeah, like he's, he's looked good. So if you have a five man rotation set, then. Manoa's just not going to be able to find a spot. He's not going to be a bullpen arm because the control issue is so glaring right now. You can't have a guy come out of the bullpen who can't throw strikes or get outs. So I would suggest they should leave him there for weeks. Let him get four, at least three or four starts down there. And then in September, if you expand the rosters, you call him up, there could be an injury, and then you slide him back in. How does that happen? How does that happen that a guy is so dominant one year? Baseball is a straight... I mean, you think about... I mean, I always, I'm always amazed at in baseball... You know, like, remember Chuck Knobloch? Couldn't throw. Couldn't yeah, throw that first. was the yips. Steve Sachs. Yeah. Couldn't throw to first base. Now, that's like a Met. This who, is not was the, the yips. Who was the catcher? The catcher couldn't throw back to the, the mound. The Mets had a catcher. Couldn't throw it back to the mound. Yeah. I don't think that happened. Like, well, remember John Lester, too. Lester yeah. could not throw to first. Yeah. Like, Lester would sometimes retrieve dribbling ground balls and throw his glove. Yes. To first base, the guy won a oh. World Series and Lucas, multiple well, World Series. We just Series. saw Lucas Glover win the PGA. He's won back-to-back events in the PGA Tour. He had the yips for like ten years. Could not putt. Like, like literally, like could not putt. There was there was a, a putt circulating online after his win yesterday. It looked like Max a Sasser, thank you. A, a two-footer, a two-footer, and he barely got it off the heel, and he jimmied it like three feet left. Like Lucas Glover was lost, was gone. Then he and changed he, to the goofy long putter. And the guy's on fire. He's won two weeks in a row. He's made like $5 million in eight days. And he's gone from 100th on the FedEx Cup standings to like fourth. He's fourth. This guy could win the Tour Championship. So, he's, he's in legit contention to be a Ryder Cup But he was pick. a monster talent coming out of college, right? Yes. He was like a college All-American. He was a superstar in the making. And all of a sudden, he forgot. Like, 
How does that happen? I, I, I don't know. I mean, for prof- I guess what that is a sign of is that these are humans. Absolutely. Yeah, like you can never forget that, that you're dealing with human beings who at any point could lose confidence. And that's effectively what it is. It's just it's, there's a mental block that does not allow them to believe they can do what they've done 10,000 times. And we are all thankful that you've never lost your confidence. I personally haven't. <laughs> not when I'm talking on a microphone anyway. Believe me, there are other parts of my life, like putting, like playing golf, where there's a number of different situations where confidence can wane. I'm playing a golf tournament on Friday. Yeah. I have not played golf yet this year. So are you Lucas my, Glover before my he found his My foursome is going to be deeply disappointed in the effort they get from me. Yeah. Do yourself a favor and don't pull a Lucas Glover. Wear dark pants. Did you see the swass yes. on him over the weekend? The what? Swass. Swamp ass. <laughs> His swass yesterday was, it was, it just, it ruined the whole scene, man. The guy beats Cantley in a playoff. And all I can think about is. And all I can, I can't stop looking at his pants. Like, it's bittersweet. The guy just made $3 million. He's fourth in the FedEx. And I guarantee he walked off and someone in his inner circle said, what the hell were you thinking? You remember- Not congratulations. What are you doing? Because you're buzzing online the fact that those pants are being worn. Do you remember Colin Montgomery played in the, uh, the U.S. Open playoff? Used to be an 18-hole playoff at Oakmont. Okay. Showed up wearing all black. Good for him. It was like 95 degrees. He knows what's up. He melted like an ice cream cone. Monty, yeah, but you couldn't see a stain. <laughs> Monty is a veteran when it comes to swaths. Because, I mean, the, the British, they don't deal with the heat too well. No. Monty knew what was going on. He knew he was going to overheat. But it didn't matter because you wear you wear a light pant in the in the south in the summer. You're so asking for trouble. I'm gonna make a note of that. So on Friday, on Friday, dark underground. pants, dark pants. Yeah, shirt. You do well. The shirt you got to be a little bit careful with too. But shirt's not as offensive for people. All right. Like look at this swass up on TSN too. Joe from the bridge has got the whole oh reel. God. Look at his pants. He looks he soiled himself. He honestly looks like he he jumped in the pool like 20 minutes before that putt and he's still he he's he's still drying out. You know who had the some of the worst swass ever and I hate to do this cuz he's an idol of mine. The Swami himself, Chris Berman, the boom. Did you see him at yeah. the pro am at yeah. the Pe- at Pebble Beach? The Swami whew, it was ugly. That was 10 or 15 years ago. Can't put yourself in that position, Gord. If you want to find uh, the video, I don't, I don't exist. The day Bob Ganey was hired mm-hmm. as the GM of the Canadians was during the Stanley Cup final in 2007, I think it was. Uh, Bob McKenzie and I do a hit from Anaheim from the parking lot in the middle of the day, and we both looked like we just took a shower. Just dying. Yeah. Like that. We sat there waiting. Who to made that call? You got to get inside air conditioning. No, we're sitting there waiting to go live. We don't have time. We wait and we wait and we wait. It's so was it breaking news? Like yeah, the Habs had just break, signed Bob. Breaking Gaines. news. They just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh seven. That I thought he was there before that. I think. It was, Did he go right from Dallas to Montreal, or was there a hiatus there for Bob? Been a hiatus, but we were we were in uh, we were in Anaheim. I remember that because the, the oh yeah oh seven that would have been the Cup parking final. lot was like yeah yeah oh that would be scorching June in Anaheim. See there you go, but you guys hopefully were wearing dark clothing suits. Suits you can cover up, though. Suits, suits covering, can be helpful. Are you covering maybe. Frisbees? In that I might be, actually, myself. Exactly. You don't have to worry about it. Um, all right. John Gibbons in about a half an hour. We should, uh, I want to mention this Rodian and Amirov story that, that broke earlier this afternoon before we go to break. It's a horrible story. Uh, he passed away today. He was a first-round pick of the Leafs a few years ago, uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor a couple years ago, fought as hard as he could, clearly. I had not heard anything about his status for quite some time. I know you're more in tune with the hockey world than I am, but his longtime agent tweeted that out today. Awful news. Heartbreaking news. And his, I think the Leafs did a great thing for him last season. Um, they brought him in for the day. He came to the morning skate. Mm-hmm. He had a little press conference in the morning, came to the game. He was with the team all day, like went to the pregame meal, all of it. Yeah. And they knew. You know, what was going on. Yeah, the diagnosis yeah, had and, been and, there. And they gave him sort of a day in the NHL, which I thought was a really classy. Very, very he classy. Was, he was overwhelmed by it. He, he was incredibly positive. You know, he was sort of, uh, he was never why me. He was, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, someone asked him, you know, oh, are you back on the ice soon? They didn't know. And he's, mm. he was like, well, you know, maybe. But, I, but yeah, he wasn't. Well, that's, that's what, you know, you, you can never prepare for a story like this. No. 
Um, but it really caught me off guard because I was of the belief, you know, a year or so ago that he was going to try to keep, continue to train and skate. And, and I just, I hadn't heard any updates in recent memory anyway of, of Rodi and Amirov. And, and obviously we know why, because he took a turn for the worse and he passed away today. So terrible story, heartbreaking story. Young guy had the, his whole life in front of him. First round pick for the Leafs. Like you said, the Leafs, you know, really classy. I saw John Tavares tweeted about it too. A number of Leafs have sent out messages. They wouldn't have known him very well, but I think that's a really classy, classy look too. Um, so obviously that that story broke today, and it's a it's a it's a heartbreaking one for sure. Rodi and Amira passing away. Um, Gordon Miller's in here with me today. I'm Brian Hayes. We got John Gibbons coming up later this afternoon. Luke Wilson will join us. How about Nathan Rourke going viral over the weekend? We'll touch on that. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. Overdrive continues. Brought to you by FanDuel. Bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hayes, Gordon Miller. I want to trade. Yeah, you're looking for a trade? I want to trade. I want you to trade me to Los Angeles. So you want to go to L.A.? I will only go to L.A. Okay. Now, if I don't pull that off, are you going to call me a liar? Yes. You lied to me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So you're playing the role of James Harden. This is a role play level of concern. And I'm Daryl Morey, who runs the show down in Philly. Liar. Uh, I'm a liar, according to you. You're an upstanding guy, though, James. Because I've only us been traded three times in the last three years. In about three years. From and, and I haven't just asked to be traded. I have asked to be traded to a specific team. And you've had your, your wish granted Yes, I said multiple to, times. I said to Houston, I'm only going to the Nets. Right. I told the Nets, I'm only going to Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And now I've told Philadelphia, I'm only going to the Clippers. Right. And now if that doesn't happen, now, then he, uh, did everyone's did he, upset. Didn't he tell Oklahoma City he'd only go to Houston? I don't recall him having as much power when he was in Oklahoma City. Because that was, remember, Durant was there and Westbrook was there. I think it was kind of, this isn't going to work. Like some, something's got to give. Maybe at some point, maybe at some point when this keeps happening, maybe you're the problem. Yeah. Well, I, I think here's at the core issue of it. Let's play the clip for those of you who are unfamiliar with what's happened today. James Harden is over in China. He's doing like media tours for Adidas. He's a, he's an Adidas endorser. Um, and he's over in China and he was speaking to a crowd and there was media there. Mike's there. And here's what James Harden had to say about his current situation in Philly. Daryl Morey is a liar and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Let me say that again. Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Everybody said, Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never play for an organization that he's affiliated with again. So, I guess the question would be, specifically, what is he saying was lied to about? So, there was talk that he wanted one of the max extensions. Right? Mm. Now, those for players of his age are problematic. Mm-hmm because the NBA has kind of adjusted the rules to make them more punitive. But if if the Sixers did say to him, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. But maybe, you know, this seems, time, the timing of this seems like the Sixers announced, that, you know, didn't announce, but made it clear that the trade is not going to happen. Right. That report came out a few days ago. The trade market's not good for him. So they expect him to come to training camp. By the way, Nick Nurse, good, good luck. That's the fly on the wall I want to hear from right now. What is Nick Nurse thinking? But, yeah, there there are two ways in which Harden could feel that he was lied to and have a legitimate gripe here. If he opted into his contract, which I believe he did on the way to Philly, with the understanding that he would get another deal yes. and that didn't end up happening, or if there was some sort of understanding that we're not aware of that Daryl Morey told him he would trade him if he wanted to be traded, and now all of a sudden he hasn't been traded. So it's not as if Harden is necessarily lying here. He could be interpreting this accurately that he felt there was like an acute lie that was told to him. And if that ends up being true and it gets out, Daryl Morey could have some big issues on his hands because that kind of stuff can permeate through the NBA. And then you've got to effectively try to reclaim your reputation or find a way to, to explain it, especially in this era where the players and the superstar players, they hold all of the cards. They hold all the power. The issue that I think Harden is not willing to address, and there's a complete lack of self-awareness here, is I don't think anyone wants James well, that's, Harden. That's it. So what, like, that's the problem. So what if Maury said, yeah, I'll do my best. I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll try to trade you, but what if what if the Clippers aren't that 
Interesting. And that's what it I sounds mean, as if has happened here. The Clippers don't need guys that can't make shots down the stretch. They've got a whole bench full of them. Exactly. Right? They don't, like, Harden did not play great. He has the reputation of modern players of being a guy that doesn't get it done in the playoffs. Right. Like, that is his reputation. He's one of the all-time great scorers. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. And, like, with what he did in Houston, and that's where, that was his heyday, great, great player. Still a very good player and very effective player. Not consistently all the time, but still very good, very effective. But not young, rarely in shape, and probably going to be a headache for you. And a con- Probably going to want out at some point. And a contract extension is going to be onerous for the team. Yes. Under this new NBA salary cap tweak, if you want to mm-hmm. call it that, contracts for players over 30 are extensions are onerous. Absolutely. So, so but, but the other thing is, is, is that things can change. So, so if, if you say to him, yeah, we're going to give you an extension or we'll look at it, and then he plays poorly, I, I'd be surprised if a veteran sports executive promised a guy an extension in advance. That would surprise me. Yeah, that generally doesn't happen. And it's, again, it's like, it's like saying, it's like saying, you know, I, he promised he would never trade him. I, I don't see many executives that would do that. No, and I think it's almost on you to believe it, even if you thought you heard that or if you right. did hear that. Here's where Harden is probably not going to get a lot of sympathy is because even if that were to be the case, even if there is some sort of shred of truth there that Daryl Morey and the Sixers promised him something or his interpretation when leaving the room was, I have been promised something. Didn't he promise Houston when he signed the deal he'd play that out? Yeah. <laughs> and then promise Brooklyn and then promise Philly. And like at some point, what goes around comes around. And I think the, the league and karma is biting James Harden in the ass here. And, did, and someone had to get hit at some point because it's ridiculous what's happening with player movement in the NBA. And ridiculous. Did, and didn't you go to Philly partly because of the relationship? Yes, Maury? because of your history in Houston. And is there history of Maury lying? Like, does he have a reputation for being duplicitous? Does he have a reputation uh, for? I, I've never. Heard, I, I don't know. I, I've never. I've never heard an accusation that that Maury has a, you know, has, has done this before or has, is slippery with players or. But the question is now that we're into mid-August, right? He should be flying into Philly in about a month. What happens now? Well, that's because this is not his first rodeo either, no, so right? The, like the way he went out in Houston, that was ugly. It was incredibly oh, unprofessional. It was. It was, it, was it was a sabotage play. And he, he bailed on them. He couldn't have made it more clear that he did not want to be there. But he got what he wanted. So why would you believe, I don't believe, that James Harden's just going to say, okay, bygones are bygones. Like, he is going to find a way to sabotage the Sixers now until they get rid of him. Finally. That's what I expect. Thankfully, Kyrie Irving came to his defense. And that's the guy you want in your corner, is Kyrie. <laughs> so so I, I just, it's hard because he is under contract. And if you want to play hardball, you can say, if you want to play in the NBA this year, it has to be for us. But mm-hmm. he would be, based on past experience, he would be so toxic. He, and he would be so unapologetically toxic. Like, it wouldn't be by accident. It wouldn't, no. be, it wouldn't be like his body language betrayed him. Oh, he, he would, knows. He, he would be... He's a veteran. Like, he's, he's going to show... If he shows up at camp to get mm-hmm. paid, he's going to make it very clear he does not want to be there. There is a playbook that has been written by recent players in the NBA, Harden has multiple chapters that he personally wrote in that playbook of how you get out and how you get what you want. Can I just, can I just say, it's five years ago that the Raptors acquired Kawhi, right? Yes, 2018. So I think you were off that day. I was hosting. <laughs> yes, I, I was. <laughs> because yeah. you take, when you, when you, when I you think you're off, right. No, I sense. can't really remember. It's a but, little bit uh, but murky. Isn't it, isn't it amazing that he came? When you think back at all that's happened in the NBA since then, isn't it amazing that Kawhi agreed to come? I I would say in in general the answer would probably be yes, but he is not your standard NBA player. He's not. The way he's wired is so different that it almost would have been surprising if Kawhi played the game the way Harden plays the game. Jimmy Butler's played the game at times. Right. LeBron's played the game. Anthony Kyrie, Davis. Anthony Davis. Like, Kawhi is just programmed differently. So it almost actually made sense and was more predictable that he did show up. But the funny thing was, remember, and play. remember when he got traded here? It was like this. He's run afoul of Greg Popovich, who's like the greatest guy ever. He's a quitter. He's cashing his check. He doesn't want to be back in San Antonio. They don't like him. And he turned out to be this 
model citizen here. Yeah, he like, was great. Great player, but just no, he, Kawhi like all these stars. He had an ego. Sure. Right. He had people around him. Like there was a lot of massaging. There was like load management was all to make sure that Kawhi was happy. Right. But I mean, when he played, he, he was great. He was outstanding. So I just outstanding. But, but now you'd almost like to see a team say, no, sit. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, that would be great if that were the case. If yeah. Maury did that with if there wasn't some sort of lie, like if there is a lie that took place here then he may have shot himself in the foot. But yes, I agree. Like, Portland is in a situation here where until they actually trade Damian Lillard, he still has two years left on his team. Right. So what happens? Like, does Dame return, or is the cat out of the bag, and Dame's just not going to show up? So the problem is... What are you going to do? So you make the stand on principle, but it costs you. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you don't have the player, and you don't have the assets you could get for the player. Right. So you're, you're hurting yourself. Well, that's especially, what ends up happening. Especially in that sport where one player can make such a difference. Yeah. Where one guy can be such a huge difference. But also this this recent development in the NBA of, as you've stated, players not only demanding out, but demanding exactly where they're going to go. Well, there. Also shortchanges the team because they're, they're, if there's no leverage, if there's no market, there's only so much you can ask for and, you know, and Matthew, expect to get. Matthew Kachuk in Calgary didn't quite do that. He He's, put like six teams together or he, something. He said, I'm not going to resign when this contract's up. So I'll, I'll play out the year, but I'm not going to resign here. And so the team realized the best value for Kachuk was they would sign him to the eight-year extension and then trade him to a team of his. He had to agree to go there, obviously. Sure. The deal is not enticing otherwise. And and so he gave them a list of teams. And fortunately for Calgary, Florida was anxious to do something. You know, they'd won the President's Trophy. They got knocked out in the second round. They got swept in the second round. They were anxious to change the record, and so Calgary got fortunate in that respect. But that's did they? Well, I think I <laughs> did think, they. Jonathan Huberto, if he plays like he did last year, they got squeezed. Well, I, I think he can't possibly be that bad. I, I think the changing coach will. I think that'll probably help. Without putting too fine a point on it, I yes. think I don't think Jonathan Huberto and Daryl Sutter. I don't think spent so. Spent much either. time together away from the rink. I don't think so either. No. But even if that were the case, that was an awful season. So, so it, it was, but what I'm saying is that's, in, in NHL terms, that's about as extreme as it gets. I mean, yeah. we haven't seen an NHL player dictate, I'm only going there. Have we? Not that I can recall. I mean, did DeBrincat effectively do that with Detroit? Well, it's the same situation where it, the only way the trade makes sense is if you trade him somewhere he wants to go. Mm -hmm. And he really desperately, I think, wanted to go to Detroit. Like, he didn't even sign a long-term extension there. Four years. Yeah. Like, that's wanting to go somewhere. Um, all right, John Gibbons in about 15 Can't minutes. Wait, he was Gibbons. I gotta tell that's you, that's your guy. He was so good to Everyone me. Everyone loves John. Gibbons. When, I used to, when I used to broadcast Jays games, I would do like eight, ten games a year, mm -hmm. and uh, it was tough. It was hard to do because mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't there every day. Two guys, Pat Tabler and John Gibbons, were unreal. To Those me. were your guys. Pat, Pat was a great partner, terrific broadcast partner, good mm -hmm. broadcaster, but but a, a generous partner. I mean, you got a hockey guy showing up for like you know. Eight, ten times a year, but he couldn't have been nicer. And John Gibbons was awesome. And and you know, again, under a lot of pressure, you know, managing the big leagues is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And he could not have been more accommodating with his time or or generous. Okay, Gibby coming up in fifteen, Probably. and the New England Patriots have signed a new running back. We'll tell you about that next. All right, so there were a couple of big-name running backs still out there on the NFL market. Dalvin Cook remains out there. Ezekiel Elliott was out there. But reports are indicating he's going to sign a one-year deal worth upwards of $6 million. With? <laughs> the New England Patriots. Bill Belichick's reclamation yard open for business, right? Come on in. Cam, Kelly Belichick. Cam Newton, Randy Moss. Yeah. Chad Otrocinco. Mm -hmm. He's had a lot of them over the years. Like Zeke. Zeke had a good run in Dallas. He was, he was one of those top 10 draft picks that you rarely see as a running back. And there were a couple of years there where he put up elite numbers. Then he had the contract dispute, and it just never. Once they paid him that second time, it wasn't wasn't going to work. Do you think backs? Are, do you think do you buy this that running backs are overrated? No, I I don't think the like the position in general is overrated. I think it's very necessary. I just think individual backs are probably they're not as important as they once were. 
Didn't, like didn't, you can do it by committee now, yeah. and it's it's a quarterback throwing league now. It's Den, not as run driven. Denver, I think, one, at one point in three straight years, they had a different running back rush for a thousand yards mm-hmm. behind that offensive line. Yeah, well, that's a big you part know, of it. So, so I, I I just wonder. I mean, uh, there are there are NFL teams that would say they they won't draft running backs in the top five. Right. Some won't in the first round. Period. Right. And and like that philosophy is out there that you absolutely shouldn't, because you know you got to use that. The NFL is driven by the quarterback, the left tackle, middle linebacker. Not even. It's like an, an edge rusher, cornerback, wide receivers. Like th- that's where the, a lot of the money and the attention goes to now, because a lot of that is driven by that's the pass game. Who's throwing? Who's protecting? Who's chasing? And who are you throwing to? And who's covering that guy that you're throwing it to? Like that's that's effectively where the game is gone in terms of where the money is at and where a lot of the focus is at. But within all of that, there's still you still need someone to get you that yard, yeah. you know, or get you those three or four yards. Or if you have a quarterback that goes down, you might really be relying on your running back. But if you can do it by committee now, then you can pay those guys on the cheap, right? If you can find a way to get to 1,500 yards through three guys and you're paying them $10 million, why pay fifteen for the one guy that's going to get you to fifteen? Makes sense. Hour two coming up. John Gibbons will join us. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2.